Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Every Nation, Brian Stin, Sevilla here. Whether you're watching this on Sunday or maybe during the week, hope you are doing well, keeping safe and staying healthy during this season. Hey, if you're watching this uh, first time or second time, tuning into Every Nation, Brian Stin, we're so privileged to have you online with us today, just for an hour. We hope this time will be of much value add to your life and that we hope that you will be able to uh, take further steps in knowing God and making him known. So today we are going to continue with our series called Voices. In fact, this is the last installment of our series called Voices. We've been doing this for a number of weeks. Words that we have felt that God wants to speak a direct voice to us as every nation, Bryanston family. And we hope that this series has been um, poignant and helpful to you and to your situation. But before I get into that, I've got some exciting news to share. Well, we are looking forward to getting back together again, but we're gonna do it a bit differently for the month of September. As you know, that currently we are only allowed to meet with a capacity of 50 people. As we've thought about it, including um, worship team and those who are gonna be serving, uh, we realized that maybe a, a better way to start in September is by doing to outside service. So here's how it's gonna look. On the 12th of September and the 26th of September. So two Sundays in September, the 12th and the 26th. Starting at 10 o'clock, we're gonna have an open air service out in the field uh, at our venue. And the way it's going to work is going to be quite simple. You're going to come in, there's going to be drinks, there's going to be food, there's going to be some activities for the kids, there's going to be a bit of worship, there's going to be the word, and just time to just fellowship and hang out afterwards. Now, you do have to register and let us know that you are coming uh, because we would love to prepare as best as we possibly can for you. So please do register, go check out our online platform, check out our website and register because registration will be limited to a hundred people. I think this would be great uh, for us, not just to meet and gather um, and hear the word, but also just to meet and gather and just spend some time with each other. Uh, I don't know about you, it's been a while being with people and it would be just great to not just uh, meet on a Sunday like we normally do, but also have an opportunity to stay afterwards, hang out, play some games and uh, get to spend a bit of the morning together. So if you're keen, and you would love to be with us, please do sign up. We're so looking forward to having you. Uh, it's gonna be a great time of us coming back together again for those two Sunday services. We are hoping that by October, we would have an opportunity to meet uh, on a more regular basis, uh, on a weekly basis, rather on Sundays, uh, as we finish off the year. Uh, next week, we start our Proverbs series. It's gonna be wild, I'm so excited. Can't wait for us to go through uh, the book of Proverbs together, which is uniquely put together. So it won't be your typical going through chapter by chapter, but there are some unique things in the book of Proverbs that go beyond doing the right or the wrong thing, but rather doing the wise thing. So we hope that this series will help you know that Jesus is wisdom for all of life. Now, as I said, we're continuing and ending today our Voices series, and I can think of no better person to do that. My wife is going to be sharing the word today. Uh, honestly, <laughs> way better Christian than me. Uh, loves the Lord uh, way better than I do. Grateful to have her in my life, but also to continue watching her example as she follows Jesus, like all of us, as she continues to know God and make him known. Hope you are blessed by this word. Amen. And so Jesus gave us a new norm of greatness. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant.
Our message is a word, and our duty is to preach it, to speak to others what God has spoken to us and given us in the Scripture. The hundreds of millions have never had the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my dear friend, we, we, we must be dynamic in our evangelism. How many souls have you passed in one for Christ this year? It's a humbling thing to come to the foot of the cross and repent of your sins and receive Christ. But I tell you, no man shall enter the kingdom of heaven unless he comes. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all of the forever, then amen. Imagine with me for a moment how it must have felt to be the first human ever created. Fresh from the ground formed by the very hands of God, from the very ground that you stand on. Imagine the conversations that you might have had with your creator as he expounded on how he created the heavens and the earth, how he placed the stars in the sky, how he created the animals of the field and the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and how all these things, including the, the fruit-bearing plants, the flowers and the trees, all coexist in this beautiful harmony synchronized, created by his very voice. And then imagine him saying to you, you are the pinnacle of all my creation. And I want to give to you, I want to entrust to you the stewardship of all this creation. Cause it to be fruitful. Cause it to multiply. Do what you need to do to extract from it its fullest potential. You are the pinnacle of my creation and I entrust all of creation to you. I can only imagine how seen, how acknowledged, how trusted one would have felt in that situation. My relationship with my father is a little bit like this in that I always felt seen in his presence. I always felt called to my highest potential in his presence, even though he was much older and a lot wiser. I always felt like he trusted me even to the point that in his final days, my father entrusted to me the things that he valued the most. So, as a self-professing daddy's girl, I want to propose this to you today. I want to say that knowing whose you are and how you perceive them will determine how you walk through the world. Knowing whose you are and how you perceive that person to be will determine how you steward your life. There is a parable that Jesus tells in the Gospels that eloquently demonstrates my proposition and it is found in Matthew 25, 14 to 13. It reads, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went 
and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Father, I ask that as we journey through this parable, that you would speak clearly to us. What an incredible, incredibly challenging season most of us have found ourselves in. But we know that in you, even in these seasons, there's so much to be gleaned. So I ask, Lord, that you would speak to every single one of us exactly where we are, empowering us to take the next right step. This parable is one of my favorite um, parables and it is between the time Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem, his epic triumphal entry with um, the children and the women and um, the people in the street laying down the palm leaves and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, declaring that indeed Jesus is the Messiah that they have been waiting for. This parable and a number of parables that Jesus tells about the kingdom are literally in the last days of his life. And he is speaking to his disciples about his coming return. In this parable, we see the master and this master is very clearly the owner of all things that are possessed in this parable. These servants are bond servants. They are in essence slaves to the master in that they are owned by him. So not only does the master own everything, he along with owning the servants entrusts the things that he owns to his servants. So he takes his possessions, his wealth, and he entrusts them to the servants. After entrusting them to the servants, or rather in entrusting them to the servants, it is clear in the parable that the master has carefully considered what to apportion to each servant according to their ability. So not only does the master own everything, but the master is the one who gives and entrusts. 
And not only does he entrust, he is the one who determines what is entrusted to whom. He considers that which he gives to each servant. After he has apportioned to them carefully what he understands their capacity would be, he leaves. The master is not one to micromanage. He is not one to give them a list of tasks and goals that they need to achieve. The master completely entrusts, demonstrating trust to the servants. The master leaves on his long journey. I want to put it to you that God is this master. God owns everything. He owns everything. In Psalm 24, he says, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The message puts it this way. God claims earth and everything in it. God claims world and all who live in it. God can make this claim because he created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. Along with creating all that we see around us, God created humanity, formed them by his very hand and continued to breathe the breath of life, continued to give generously his spirit to animate this man that he has formed. God owns everything, even that breath that you have just taken. He owns it and he claims it. The Bible is replete with the claims of God on everything. Job correctly perceives this in Job 12, 10, where he says the life of every living thing is in his hand, that is, in God's hand, as well as the breath of all humankind. Paul echoes Job in Acts 17, 28, stating, For in him we live and move and have our being. Ellicott's commentary puts it in this way. He says, these words that we've just read do not express merely the omnipresence of the deity. They tell us that the power for every act and sensation and thought comes from him. The power of every act, of every sensation and thought comes from him. It is very easy after countless times of waking up in the morning and giving yourself to different tasks, whether it's going to work to receive an income, uh, making breakfast for your children so that they are strong and they are healthy, giving yourself to your studies so that you can grow in your skill and seeing the fruit that comes from all these actions. It is very easy to begin to believe that those things are yours. But what the Bible is trying to teach us, what these writers are trying to get us to see is that all things that are as a result of the energy that you have exerted are because God has given you that energy. Everything that you give yourself to, you cannot give yourself to outside of God having initially given you your breath, given you the power that you have, given you even, dare I say, the, the ability to think and feel and create and contemplate, given you this ability to be alive, to be human. Nothing that is as a result of your efforts is yours because God is the source. He is the source from whom 
all things flow. And you belong to him and everything that flows from you belongs to him. If you believe that you ultimately belong perhaps to a certain group, whether it is you find meaning or significance from being a part of that group, in the same way that understanding that you belong to God and your stewardship of everything that you have would be on, in service to God. If you understand yourself to belong to a certain group, everything that you have will be stewarded in service to those things. If you believe that you belong to your family, Everything that you do consciously or subconsciously will ultimately be in service to your family. The invitation here is to realize that you belong to God and that faithful stewardship relies on you understanding who ultimately owns you, who you ultimately belong to. If you believe that ultimately you belong to no one, you will steward your life and everything that you have in service to yourself. This may sound appealing and possibly the best way, but when we look at history, we see how the selfish desires of a few for power, for influence, for control, have left us with a world filled with injustice and inequality and insurmountable pain. Again, I want to say to you, you belong to God, especially you who have given your life to God in following Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Everything that you are, all the way down to your breath, to your inhaling, to your exhaling. Everything that you are needs to be stewarded in a way that recognizes, that flows from understanding that you belong to God. That's the first thing I wanted to speak to you about, ownership. The second is stewardship. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines stewardship as the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So looking at this parable, what is the first thing that comes to your mind in measuring what good stewardship is? At first, I was convinced that good stewardship is measured by the amount of profit produced. And this, this sounds perfectly reasonable, right? Well, naturally, it left me feeling overwhelmed and like I had to do more. And on top of the very much that I'm doing, which I sometimes feel I'm not doing well at all at, that feeling left me wanting to kind of curl up in a fetal position with Lonabo and leave all the adulting to Ovayo, my 10-year-old. Side note, a majority of my adulting is actually looking after my six-year-old, Kuze. And Ovayo seems to have a way with him, a way to get him under control. Okay, sure, it's kind of replete with a lot of manipulating and scheming and some high-pitched discourse. But, eh, you know, she gets the job. <laughs> she gets the job done. But I digress. When I took a deeper look at the text, it occurred to me that the master's measurement of stewardship was not the profit produced, was not the five to 10 or the two to four. Neither was it just the saving of the one talent, but the master based good and faithful stewardship on the servant's 
actions as they pertained to their knowledge of him, their perception of him and his business and how he runs it. What do I mean by this? To the hearers of this text, um, they would have understood that in the master leaving his possessions to his servants and going on a long journey, that it was implicit in him entrusting to them um, the things that he valued, that they needed to look after those things in the way that he himself, the master, would have looked after those things. So they would have understood that it was the responsibility of the servants to carry on, to continue with business as usual. And because they are the servants of the master, they would have understood his business and they would have known how to conduct his business. So it was implicit in the giving of the talents what the master expected in his absence. I want to put it to you that the master in entrusting to them his wealth was not just giving them stuff to do or just looking for a profit. I want to put it to you that the master was inviting them into an opportunity of growth. Stewardship then, in this case, was an invitation to move from being a servant to becoming a ruler. It was in an invitation for them to grow into themselves, to grow into their potential, to mature, as it were, from those who were just servants to those who could rule. I say this because we see in his response to the two who were faithful with that which he had given them, he says to them, well done, you have been faithful over the little that I entrusted you. Now come, I will make you ruler of much. Come and share in my joy. I really do believe that that was the intention of the master all along, to give them this opportunity to rise into themselves, to rise into rulership. He could have just as easily said, well done, you did well. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to share the profits with you. And as a slave, that would have been that would have been a, 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 a reasonable thing or a beyond a reasonable thing for the master to say to you that he's sharing his profits with you. But instead, we see that this master is generous. He's generous. Not only does he say, well done, but he says to them, come and share in my joy because of your faithfulness. Not only does he say, well done, and you remain a slave. He says, no, come up. Come higher, come into rulership with me. He is a generous master. Paul, speaking about our generous master, Jesus, says this in Romans 8. He says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. You have not. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you, when he brought you in as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are heirs. We have an inheritance in him. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's very glory. Other translations say we are now co-heirs with Christ because of how we have stewarded our faith. How we have stewarded our knowledge of Jesus and our revelation of Jesus will bring us from being servants into being sons who are then co-heirs with Jesus. 
we see that the first two servants acted on their knowledge of their master in a way that was congruent to how they perceived him to be and how he would run his businesses. While the third servant, his knowledge and his actions were clouded by fear. This fear led him to focus on preserving himself and not on pleasing the master. This fear led him to hiding, to shrinking, to preserving, not taking the risk, not stepping out in faith to function as the master would have expected him to. Instead, he hid the talent and proceeded in his moment of having to account about what he did with what his master gave him to give excuses. He says, it's because you are this type of master. I was then afraid because you seem to reap where you have not sown. He was ready with his excuse. And I shudder at the excuses that we readily embrace to affirm why we hide, to affirm why we abdicate the opportunity, the responsibility, the invitation to participate in the things of God, to participate in the building of the kingdom. I'm not saying this because I am perfect and I have no excuses. I too have excuses that I readily embrace. God, you must understand. Having three children, it's a lot. <laughs> God, you must understand. Having Siv for a husband is great. <laughs> but Hear me when I say this, God is not appeased by our excuses, neither will he change his standards to fit our excuses, to fit our version of why we did or we didn't choose to respond to his invitation in a way that is laced with faith. I want to take this moment to, to pause and, and gently invite you to come out of hiding. I know that it can be overwhelming, that living can be overwhelming. Even obeying God can feel overwhelming. I know that even for some of us, we can feel like our voices are not heard in the spaces that we're in, or we can feel that there isn't sufficient space for us to show up fully. And over the years, we have given ourselves to hiding and we, we, we have embraced the excuse so fully, so fully, whatever your excuse may be, I want to invite you to come out of hiding because you serve a good God and you are here, you are here on this earth to mature into the fullness of who God created you to be. There is no maturing, there is no growing, there is no moving from slave to ruler without stepping out in faith. God is not concerned about the profit or the lack thereof. God is concerned about your faith, your faith in him and how you exercise that faith. Come, come out of hiding. Do not embrace the darkness that is shrinking, the darkness that is being small, the darkness that is, that is hiding underground. Come up, bloom, blossom, embrace the gifts, the talents, the skills, the faith, the calling, the purpose that God has given to you. Partner in faith and take the risk of at least trying to multiply, trying to be fruitful. The invitation is one that is calling you to participate in the kingdom 
of heaven. In this parable, Jesus is answering a question that his disciples asked in an earlier interaction pertaining to his coming return. And in it, he is encouraging them to be about the business of the kingdom until he returns. Like any responsible master, he must return. Like any responsible owner, he must return. He must come back to collect that which is his. And like any responsible owner, he must settle accounts. I was invited to speak at a women's conference last week and I was speaking on this text and I gave this example that as the owner of a business, if I had to go away and leave portions of my business to um, employees and for example, the one employee with the franchise in Santon decided that, you know what, I'm actually too overwhelmed by the prospect of running this business. I, you know, I can't. So what I'm going to do is knowing and, and, and perceiving that Marsh is a good business person and she's a mover and a shaker and all these things, what I'm going to do in order to not disappoint in order to not fail, in order to not take risks that may result in something terrible happening, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to close the doors of her business. Even as you hear that, you know, you know that as a responsible owner, when I return, that I will not be pleased by her decision. Yes, I may empathize with the sense of feeling overwhelmed. Yes, I may even try and understand what it is that she struggled with. But still, it would not be reasonable for me to change my business model, to change my expectations because of her perceptions, whether it's her perceptions of herself or her perceptions of me. I would have to come and settle accounts and that employee would not have a place in the business. <sighs> Jesus is a responsible master and he will come and settle accounts. But you and I have valuable insight from this parable and I'll conclude in this way. Jesus is the epitome of what good and faithful stewardship looks like. Jesus is the epitome of what good and faithful stewardship looks like. There is a passage in the Gospels where Jesus, the night before, having been in the Garden of Gethsemane and having had this deep, profound heart to heart with God saying, Lord, I know, I know, Father, that I have this heavy responsibility of stewarding my life in such a way that it, it results in salvation, salvation for all of humanity. But if there is another way, if there is another way, God, I do not have a preference for this way. If anything, I would rather not do this, but not my will but yours be done. Jesus having come from this moment, being arrested and being handed over to Pilate, we see whoa, the, the most profound interaction where Pilate says to him, these Jews, these people of yours have given you over to me and they want you to be crucified. And the Jewish people are, are, are adamant. The, the, the leaders of the Jews are adamant that he must be crucified. Pilate says to him, talk to me, speak to me. Do you not see that I have the power to let 
you go. Pilate, in essence, unknowingly is saying to Jesus, Jesus, I have the power to grant you your will. But Jesus, knowing who God is, knowing how God is, choosing to trust God even after that moment where he said to God, not my will, but your will be done because I am struggling and I would rather not do this. Having settled that this trajectory was the will of God for him, Jesus did not take the way out that Pilate was giving to him. What Jesus did is that he proceeded to do the next right thing. Jesus, the faithful steward of salvation, proceeded in the coming hours, the coming day, to do the next right thing, even if that next right thing was him hanging on a cross for sins he did not commit. Do you know why? Because he knew and trusted God even unto death. Knowing the Father, knowing the business of the Father, in seasons of feeling overwhelmed, in seasons even of feeling insufficient, in seasons of feeling weak, even in seasons of feeling disqualified, knowing the Father and aligning ourselves with his purpose, choosing to do the next right thing is what we need to give ourselves to. Are you overwhelmed? Do the next right thing. Are you anxious? Do the next right thing. Are you afraid? Do the next right thing. You belong to God and your stewardship is not about doing everything or doing things perfectly, but rather your stewardship is about doing the next right thing and then doing the next right thing after that. We do not need to know completely. We do not need to, to be um, certain of the outcome. Our stewardship is not one that only counts when the outcome is one of profit as we perceive it, but our stewardship is, is anchored on this idea of doing the next right thing. So as we close off this series and we head toward the latter parts of the year, we're not going to be doing <laughs> everything. We definitely are not going to be doing nothing, but let us give ourselves to doing the next right thing. For some of you, that next right thing may be the issue of settling the question of ownership. For some of you, the next right thing may be an issue of you recommitting or freshly giving your life to God. And if that is you, please respond in the comment section by raising your hand and one of our leaders will get a hold of you in the week to help you take your next steps in doing the next right thing. God bless you. Hey family, thank you so much for joining us today. Hope that word was meaningful and helpful to you. Hey, uh, before we go, I want to remind you of our two open air services on September the 12th and September the 26th. Sign up today. We would love for you to register so that we can prepare for you. Can't wait to see you and give you a hug from a distance. Make sure you bring your masks with you. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure to be as socially distanced as we possibly can. 
With that being said, I want to remind you of connect groups. Uh, with each series we start, I love to encourage people to join a group because really it's great to work through a series together with other people. And the book of Proverbs, as we work through what wisdom is, what it looks like for different situations, it's so worthwhile doing in the company of other people rather than by yourself. So do sign up for a connect group now. I'm looking forward to connecting you to that. And those of you who want to take your next steps, uh, doing the next right thing by knowing God and making him known, if you want to take your next steps in your faith, whether you're new or old in the faith, I want to encourage you to sign up for our Pathways class. This happens every Sunday, 2 o'clock over Zoom with a bunch of great leaders. You won't regret the investment you make in your foundations as you take your next step. So sign up for Pathways today. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Hidden in the strength of you, steady hope we hold on to. Covered in your confidence, no matter what we're going through. Arms of faithfulness so wide, your presence is our heart's delight. Even when we're feeling far, you will satisfy. For nobody else will do. There is no one like you. This is true praise when we bring all we are. This is true love when we give all our hearts. This is true joy when we find we belong. This is true worship, giving more than our song. So worthy God, you are all
this church. Show.